and everything. So, <laughs> um, so um, as Kristen mentioned, I went to the University of Illinois. I grew up in Chicago, which doesn't really sound like a place where people get a lot of nature. <laughs> but um, where I lived in Chicago, I actually lived by a, um, there was a railroad track that went right behind my house. And that doesn't sound real nature-y either, but um, the rail companies often, you know, have land uh, along the railway. And that land was actually a wet, small wetland in Chicago. And this was quite a few years ago. Um, but at the time that I was a kid, that those wetlands along the railroad tracks were where I went to play. So I, I caught tadpoles and fish and salamanders, and that's what I did as a kid growing up in Chicago. So, you know, moving to some place like Toledo, which is um, sort of a, you know, similar city in many ways, a lot smaller, um, kind of feels like home and looking for those places where you can, um, you know, be, you're, you live in the city, but you can access those places where you find wildlife and fish. Um, you know, it, I think it's something we can learn, learn to appreciate. Um, one thing that Kristen, um, also said she's heard a couple of people express interest in, in between um, bachelor's and master's degree, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. And I um, worked in aquaculture in West Africa, raising fish in small ponds. So, um, you know, I got, got out of school for a little while, but it, it was something that I wanted to come back to and do research, so I came back and did a, a master's and a PhD. Um, and if, if there are people who are interested in, you know, what, what happens when you go in the Peace Corps, that's something I'd, I'd be happy to talk to people about later, too. So, um, What I'm, I'm going to talk about today, though, um, are, is um, tell you about an overview of um, several different research projects over the past um, years that have come together, looking at um, the importance of the Maumee River as fish habitat. So um, I'll show you I'll show you some pictures um, of and you know maps of where, where I'm talking about. But first I want to um, um, first I want to make the point <laughs> that, that rivers are corridors. Um, and and you know if you've taken ecology classes for those of you who you know who are undergraduates and, and have taken ecology classes or even in your high school classes. That makes sense. Rivers are long, thin places. Things move through them. They are corridors. So things travel up and down rivers. Um, in the case of the Maumee River going through Toledo, it's also a corridor through the city. So as you can see from this picture that Dr. Fussell risked her life to take hanging out of a small aircraft, um, you know, the, it's, it's the, the Maumee River Here's Lake Erie out here, the mouth of the river, and the river comes through it. This is really a place where things, where wildlife and people have access to natural areas in the city. So birds use the river. Um, turtles, snakes, other, um, you know, reptiles and amphibians use the river. So all these things are pictures that were taken in the, the lower Maumee River area. People use the river. You know, where, where can people go to be outside and have an, ex, you know, experience with um, fishing and other, other um, water activities? They come to the river. So people, you know, fish along the river. People row along the river. This is, you know, this is a, an opportunity within a city for people to get this experience and for the organisms that travel through that area. So. Um, Water and organisms travel from the river to the lake, and in some cases, back again. So there's a lot of transport. Um, and that's very important, probably for the lake and for the river. So um, a lot of you probably know about this. There's, there's a lot of phosphorus coming off of the watershed in the Maumee River. I will not talk about harmful algal blooms <laughs> after this slide for those of you that have been out here for the past eight weeks. So this is this is review for, for most of you. You know, there's there's a lot of agriculture in the Maumee River drainage, um, a lot of fertilizer application, a lot of um, intense animal farming. That phosphorus gets into the river and eventually comes down to the lake. So what do you get? You get this. Um, you all know about this. So this is one way in which the river is a corridor. There's transport of materials 
in the water into the lake. And in some cases, those materials are things that you know fuel the um, algal blooms. But it's a two-way street. It's not just phosphorus coming off the watershed and down into the lake. Fish, migratory fish, um, in many cases, travel up rivers to access some specific habitat. In many cases, it's habitat that is used for spawning. So there are lots of species in Lake Erie that do this, that travel up into rivers to carry out their spawning. Things, familiar things like walleye, shad, um, you know, uh, freshwater drum, all use this river habitat um, to come up to find spawning locations. Um, one example of a fish that a lot of people are familiar with that do this is the walleye. So, um, you know, you probably, if, if any, how many of you fish? A lot of you. So you're probably familiar to some extent with walleye. And, and to you, that's what a walleye looks like. That's the adult fish. But those adult fish um, have to find the, the right kind of habitat for spawning. They lay eggs that then develop into a tiny little fish that goes through a lot of metamorphosis and then they you know, finally develop into something that just looks like a small fish. So they have this life cycle that they go through. And part of that life cycle is, are these eggs that require a particular kind of habitat for the survival to this, to this next baby fish stage. So in um, Western Lake Erie, there are four primary stocks of walleye that spawn in different places around the lake. Most of uh, the, the, popu the um, overall population spawn on reef complexes out in the lake. So they have a hard, rocky substrate out in the center of the lake. But then there are three river populations, um, where places where fish also spawn. Up in the Detroit River, so if you're not you know, familiar with how water moves through the Great Lakes, the Detroit River is not really a river. It's called a connecting channel. It's all the water from the upper Great Lakes coming through um, this passageway and into Lake Erie before it you know, travels across the lake and then over to Lake Ontario. So it's a, a lot of flow and it's very consistent. So it's different than other rivers. So there's um, walleye that spawn in the Detroit River. There's also walleye that spawn in the Sandusky River and in the Maumee River. So of the four um, important spawning populations of walleye in Lake Erie, Three of them are stocks that spawn in rivers, and that's important. So um, having these different populations is important to the overall population, um, because when they spawn in different places, they are literally putting their eggs in different baskets. You know, it's not just all in one place. So conditions are different in those different rivers at different times. Um, and that kind of averages out. Think about, we're talking about stocks of fish, but think about your stock por portfolio. Maybe you don't have stock portfolios yet, but someday you'll have a stock portfolio and you want it to be diverse. So you want different stocks that respond differently. So on average, um, there's always something that's working well. So having these different populations in rivers is really important for maintaining that total population and keeping fluctuations in the population from being so, you know, from being, um, you know, really crazy from year to year. So if we want to know how many fish are using a particular habitat, I'm interested in, in the Maumee River because that's close to, you know, my home. But you can think about this for, for any of the rivers. If you want to know how many fish are using a particular habitat, how do you figure that out? You don't just go stand on the side of the river and say one fish, two fish. You know, you, you, you can't do that. You need some special tools to figure out how many fish are using that habitat. <laughs> so um, one way that um, fishery scientists do this is with hydroacoustics. And that's how um, a graduate student that works in my lab addressed this question for the Maumee River. So hydroacoustics, um, very fancy word, it's a fish finder. But it's a sciencey fish finder. And it produces um, you know, images that can be converted with so specific software to data. Um, and we can get counts and approximate size measurements of fish that are moving through a particular, that get you know, hit by the, the sound wave. So um, that was how we addressed looking at um, how many fish use the Maumee River as a spawning habitat. 
And what Jeremy did was kind of set up um, a series of transects in this area. So just to orient you to what we're looking at here. Here's um, the mouth of the river out here. Um, that's uh, if you've ever driven through there. There's um, the 280 bridge, um, and um, right here in this area is almost a, a you know just a bend in the river where it's almost a straight shot right through there. And so Jeremy set up a series of transects with this hydroacoustic unit here hanging off the side of the boat. We thought this was a, a good place to count fish accessing the river, kind of thought of it as a gateway, to get up into the river into places where we know or we think walleye like to spawn, they have to travel through this um, location. So that was a good place to um, do our, his measurements. Um, but the hydroacoustic unit doesn't tell you what kind of fish it is. It only tells you how big it is. So um, Jeremy also had to carry out gill net sampling um, along with the, uh, the uh, hydroacoustics to figure out how many of the fish were walleye. So what did he find? Um, Jeremy found in the two years that he did these estimates, which were 2011 and 12, that a little over half a million fish travel up the Maumee River to spawn. So that's, that's a big number. You know, half a million of anything is a lot. But Lake Erie is a great lake. It's a big lake. Um, we think that's probably about five, maybe a little bit more than 5% of the total lake population is coming up the Maumee River to spawn. Even though that's not, you know, most of the fish in the river, um, keep in mind that we think keeping these distinct stocks viable is important for maintaining, keeping your eggs in different baskets and keeping that stock diversity. So we have an idea of how many adult fish swim up the river. So they go up the river to spawn, then what happens? What comes out of the river? We also wanted to get some estimates of how many larval walleye come out of the river. So um, we did that by um, towing um, these, they're called bongo nets, there's two of them together. Um, did, did students went out and just did a lot of this. <laughs> there was a lot of net towing on the Maumee River on the recent years that we were doing this. This is um, looking down into a sample that they've collected. You can see the, like here, one of the little heads sticking out with the, the dark eyes there. So um, quite, quite a few um, fish in some cases in each sample. Um, to kind of give you a better picture of what they look like, this is a baby walleye. So this is probably, probably about 10 millimeter walleye. Um, doesn't really look like a fish yet. I mean, it, it's going to be a fish, but, you know, it just has, the fins are not really developed here. It has a really short intestinal tract. Um, it's just starting. It does have a mouth. They are functionally eating at this size, but there's a lot of development before it really looks like something that you would recognize as a fish. Um, here's another one just sitting on a Abe Lincoln's head on a penny to kind of give you a better scale for what they look like. These are really small. So um, you know, that's, that's how they start out. It's very, very tiny. So over the years, we um, did these measurements and estimated the number of fish, um, larval walleye, exiting the river from 2010 to 2015. And we were able to get from a colleague um, some historical data from the 90s. So every year, um, we estimated that there's between, you know, 11 and 85 million larval walleye exported from the Maumee River. So that's, that's a lot of babies. You know, there's millions of these walleye coming out of the river. And that's just the walleye. We, you know, we also counted um, fish of, all, of many of the other families. And there, when you put them all together, it's billions of fish coming out of the river. So this is, you know, this is an important, or this is a large number of these fish. Now, you know, if you're looking at a, a larval walleye like this, they don't all make it to be big fish. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot can happen along the way in a baby fish's life. So certainly not all these fish live, but it is a big number coming out of the river. And you can also see from here, there's a lot of variability. Every year is different. So, um, you know, those are some of the, the takeaways that we learned from these studies. Um, we also were able to um, go back and find some historical data. Um, I actually believe it was Professor Herdendorf from Ohio State who had done some um, studies in the Maumee River in the, the late 1970s. So, um, and this was a project that um, a graduate, an undergraduate student did as part of his um, research at the university that he ended up getting published in um, 
a good ecology journal. So, um, you know, definitely things come out of undergraduate projects. And he compared the whole larval fish assemblage when in the in these two years that we had um, complete fish fish community data for 2010 and 2011 to these um, historic years in the 70s. And what he saw was that um, in the more recent years, ecological diversity was higher than in the 70s. Um, another way to look at that is just how many families of fish or how many genera of fish were there. So in the, the years that we were studying, there were more families of fish present than in the 70s and more genera of fish present. So um, he also looked at abundance of some of the um, you know popular fish like walleye and abundance was the same or greater in the recent years. So this is good. Diversity is up from the 1970s. So all we did was go out and make measurements. We weren't doing experiments or anything trying to figure out why this happened. But we can kind of put together, you know, we can tell some stories <laughs> about why this might have happened. So here's the, the two time periods when we had data for and we compared our data, the 70s and 2010-11. So what happened around these time periods? Well, shortly before um, the historical data that we had, the Clean Water Act was signed by Richard Nixon. It's one of history's great ironies. So uh, the Clean Water Act was put into effect in the early 1970s. So that was the beginning of improved water quality in the region. Um, a lot of other things happened in the late or in the 1980s. Zebra mussels. Um, made their way into the Great Lakes. Now, they're an invasive species. They're, they do a lot of harm in many ways, but they do clear the water. So <laughs> that is, you know, that is something that, that you know, zebra mussels do. Um, many other things happened. In the 90s, gobies came in. Now, we didn't have goby larvae in our study. They were not present there. But there, there are just, you know, there's a lot of other things going on during this time period. But overall, um, you know, after the Clean Water Act and some other um, changes in land use, um, during the period from the 70s to the um, 1990s, we saw in, re, improved water quality in the region, specifically reduced sediment loading into rivers. So that is something that, um, you know, would be consistent with seeing um, more diversity and a more diverse fish community using that Maumee River habitat. So we don't know which one of these things, you know, was a trigger, but it makes sense that improved water quality would promote what we observed, seeing higher diversity. But just, you know, we have seen improved water quality, but that's not the end. That's not the end of the story. There's, there's a lot of other issues um, in a place like the Maumee River. There's dams, there may be other barriers, and there's certainly a lot of habitat degradation. So um, what else do we need to know about this system? Well, one um, recent master's student in the lab wanted to know um, where walleye are spawning. So we have some idea of how many fish come up the river. And I think people think they know where fish are spawning because we know where we see fishermen. So we know some places that, that fish are congregating. But I, I, it was really kind of... Um, crazy to me that, you know, this important sport fish in a pretty well-studied river, people did not know what the distribution of spawning habitats was. So um, what this student did in 2014 and 2015 was sample a series of sites um, over these two years in the region of the river where we thought it was likely that there was good spawning habitat. So we wanted to focus on places where we thought there was going to be good spawning habitat. We wanted to know how far up the river do they travel to spawn. So that was what he set out to do. Um, and he did this um, by pumping, um, creating a, a suction pump um, that, you know, sucked water through this pipe and then put it through um, this hose into a basket lined with mesh and we retained all of the eggs. Um, it's a really heavy pump that <laughs> had to be um, carried down the bank and floated around the river. Um, this doesn't give us really a measurement of exactly how many eggs are in an area. It's just a relative measure. So they would run this sampling for a certain number of minutes at each site, you know, and, and standardize it to get a relative 
number of eggs in these different places. So um, these are what his data looked like. So let me orient you to this graph. I know it's after dinner and a lot of graphs might, might be dangerous, but <laughs> yeah, this is a pretty easy one to look at. So um, what this axis is, is the, mean, uh, the relative abundance. So that's the number of eggs per, per sampling event. We standardized sampling event. It was always the same amount of time and you know, try to approximate the same amount of area. But it's just a relative number. And these, this is um, river kilometers. So this was the first site that was sampled, the one closest to the mouth of the river. And as you go along here, you're going further away from the mouth of the river. So in the blue dots and line is 2014, the orange is 2015. So there's some differences between the two years, but a general pattern of higher values at the first couple of sites closer to the river. Also, note, you notice there's crazy variance at some of these sites. And that kind of makes sense. Anything on the bottom, um, you know, it's patchy. It's very patchy. So you can be sampling something one place, and you turn around and go a meter the other way, and it's, it's a different bottom. So the event, people who study the bottom are used to this. You can't stir the bottom of a river. It's, it's, you know, it's not homogenous. So these, you know, first sites are producing, or we're finding a lot of eggs at those. But then something's happening. Something's happening as you go upstream. We're finding eggs closer to the mouth of the river and not farther upstream. So um, this is not what I expected. I, I did not expect to find this. I expected to see fish spawning all the way up to the first dam in the river. So it's kind of it's fun when you do science and it's not what you expected. Oh, that's how we did it. We didn't know the answer before we started. So um, this location right here is called um, Jerome Rapids. Rapids obviously means it's a place where the water um, goes a little bit faster. So um, um, let's look at some maps of what's on the bottom of the river. So um, Brian, a master's student, and um, Jessica Sherman, who's a PhD student at the University of Toledo, spent a lot of time mapping substrates in the Maumee River. They did um, a lot of uh, every 250 meters in this section, I think, Kristen maybe participated <laughs> in some of the walking transects. They also um, combine that with um, side, scan, side scan sonar up and down the entire length of the river to generate a map of substrate. So um, anything green is good for walleye. It's gravel cobbles. It's what they prefer, what they're looking for. Um, red is bad. Um, you know, this is the mouth of the river. It's the shipping channel. It's muck very soft substrate. So that's not generally what um, walleye are looking for. And we can see there's two real concentrations of the good substrate that walleye are generally looking for. Um, this is a picture near Sidecut Metro Park in the summer when the water is very low. This is what the fish want. This is what they're looking for. So these cobbles, um, there's little spaces. There's nooks and crannies in between the cobble and the egg can fall down and they're not too far down, but far enough to be protected. They don't just get swept downstream, as if they, which is what happens if they get um, left on bedrock, where there's no like nooks and crannies for them. So this is what they are looking for. So um, we're going to put Brian's egg density data next to the substrate map. And um, you see that you know these high densities and how what this graph, how these graphs work, um, this Right here is a, the substrate map we just looked at, although with a few broken up into more categories. And then this um, graph of the river has dots on it that are showing you, um, that are proportional to the number of eggs that were found at each one of those sites. And this is the first year that we sampled 2014. So these high egg densities line up pretty well with these areas of cobble. That's what they're looking for, and that's where we're finding lots of eggs. But as you get past this area, we're finding very few eggs, and in many cases, absolute zero eggs, even though, like, these sites right here are lining up with this nice green, this is cobble substrate. This is exactly what they're looking for, and there we're not finding walleye eggs there. Hey, Chris. Sure. I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't know if you want to take questions now, but the other observation that I have is they're also right upstream of parts where the river uh, divides. Uh, Those are islands. So yeah. I'm, but but I'm just in, it's just interesting that the spots that they picked are also kind of lining up with right at the upstream part of an island. Is that just because that's where you'll find the color? 
parameters, that big, you know. So let's look at that compared to our map. So we need about six, you know, six and a half million square meters. And if we look at the, the really good, the optimal habitat, we've got you know seven and a half, you know, seven point seven million square meters. If we count all the good habitat. So that's enough. But if fish don't go <laughs> only halfway up the river, it's not enough. So what this is suggesting is that there may actually be some habitat limitation for walleye in the Maumee River. Um, you know, and there's a lot of questions here. You know, are these good but not perfect habitats? How you know how how high, how highly are those used? How many eggs can those support? But if you're just looking at you know, like the really desirable habitat, this is suggesting that there's you know maybe some habitat limitation for this population. So um, that's that is what um, you know Brian's work has shown. So and if you think about that. Velocity barrier. Why is the water going so fast through there? Because the Maumee River used to run through the Great Black Swamp. This red area is the area that was historically the Great Black Swamp. If you squint really hard, if you're sitting in the back, you'll see tiny little green dots. Those are the remaining, <laughs> the remaining wetland areas in this region. So, I mean, we're putting a lot of water into that river way faster than it historically should. So it's not surprising that you're getting these flashy periods that some of the native fish are not adapted to. So you know, I, I think that's definitely something to uh, to think about. But we don't want to, um, you know, get get too too down here. <laughs> you know, there's there's definitely um, you know suggestion that there's the habitat is limiting for um, walleye. And I did show you data about larval fish suggesting that. Water quality is better than the 70s, and that we're seeing higher diversity. But if we compare, you know, our average um, family diversity from our sampling was well, better than the 70s, but it's not as high as historic levels. So historically, um, you know, as far as we know, you know, before um, heavy, you know, the most impactful European settlement, there were 14 different families of migratory fish spawning in the River, and now we're down to 10. So some improvement from the 70s, but we're still missing some families based on the you know what we know about um, the more distant past. Um, and one of those missing families is this fish. So sturgeon used to um, use the Maumee River as a spawning habitat. And I say used to. They are one of the, the families that is no longer there. As far as we know, they are functionally extirpated. Um, but that's hopefully about to reverse. <laughs> so um, colleagues um, of mine at the Toledo Zoo, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, um, in collaboration with Michigan DNR, um, and colleagues of, um, that I work with at the University of Toledo have recently been informed that a proposal to build a sturgeon rearing facility near the mouth of the Maumee River has been funded. So construction of the facility is going to begin in uh, 2017 and probably have the first uh, fish released in 2018. So I think this is fantastic. We know we've lost some diversity. Um, sturgeon are one of the fish that are gone. So just to orient you, here's the mouth of the river. Um, there's the Toledo Zoo. Their property goes down to the river and that's where this facility will be constructed. Um, sturgeon were very abundant in the river. Um, They've been, as far as the, what the historical record says, is you know functionally extirpated since the late 1800s. Um, this is an article from the Toledo newspaper from 2001. Somebody saw one sturgeon, you know, and that, that was a big deal. It made the paper, but they're not reproducing in the river anymore. So again, you know, these timelines. If you think about, well, what happened? What you know, what what brought us to this point where this large, you know, interesting fish has been wiped out from the Maumee River? Um, Lake Erie had a lot of commercial fishing for sturgeon in the 1800s. The fishery peaked um, in the late 1880s with about 2 million kilograms of harvest from Lake Erie. That's a lot of fish being pulled out of the lake. Um, so this whole time period, the late 1800s to the early 1900s, was um, decline. 
through the early 1900s, catch was, was dwindling. Here you're going from million kilograms to thousands of kilograms. So, you know, they were, they were fished out during that time period. Um, commercial fishing was stopped in the 1960s. Um, 70s, um, sturgeon populations in Lake Erie were estimated to be at 1% of historic levels out in the lake. So that's not much, black fact. But then, um, since the 1990s, there's been um, interest in um, reestablishing populations, and one of the tools for reestablishment is carrying out habitat suitability index models for lake sturgeon. So what's the habitat suitability index? You're figuring out if there's still enough habitat where they can live in a particular place. Is there enough suitable habitat for these fish? So we talked about all these changes in the Maumee River. Here's a picture of the port of Toledo. That is an altered habitat. You know, there's, there's a lot going on there that's not necessarily what a surgeon is looking for. Um, you know, here's the, the first um, large dam on the river in the, um, uh, in, uh, the Providence Dam in Grand Rapids. So there's, there's a lot of, you know, potential challenges to habitat for sturgeon. Um, we don't know if it was just overfishing or if there's some key habitat feature that is now missing. So um, Jessica Sherman is a PhD student at the University of Toledo, and she carried out as part, um, as a preface to um, this reintroduction, a habitat suitability model. So habitat suitability are um, commonly used tools um, for as part of species restoration plans. So you're evaluating habitat requirements for different life history stages to tell if there's enough suitable habitat. So um, this is the model that Jess constructed for adult sturgeon. So she took a bunch of different factors that we know are important, substrate, water depth, water velocity, went to the literature and figured out what ranges of these um, factors can sturgeon live in. You know, what kind of substrates do they want? Well, they want cobble and gravel, same as um, the walleye. They can probably make do with sand and bedrock in some places, silt and clay, no go. If there's silt and clay, they're just not going to be able to spawn there. Water depth, and so that's why in the, this is just showing in the model, if it's silt and clay, that area is just out. Like there's, you know, there's no, not even worth considering. Water depth, you know, they do have preferences, but it's a little bit more forgiving and the same with water velocity. So Jessica developed this model for adult sturgeon and for um, juvenile stur sturgeon. Um, juvenile sturgeon are a little bit more generalist. Um, they're going to prefer a different habitat to the adults for spawning. They want, you know, anything from sand to gravel and cobble. Um, they don't like um, living on, on bedrock, too much shear force going over it. Um, but again, you know, they have preferences for water depth and water velocity. Um, and what Jess came up with were a series of maps. This is actually, you know, pretty much the same map that you saw for, for walleye. Um, things are categorized a little bit differently, but you see these two areas of, you know, prime spawning habitat for sturgeon. She also categorized water depth, and then she categorized velocity. And then she put those all together and then calculated how much of the river is suitable spawning habitat for lake sturgeon. Turns out it's about 12%. So it's not most of the river, but it's about 12% of the river. Um, you know, and it's a, it's a fair number of hectares that are available for spawning. Um, she repeated this with the age zero sturgeon. Again, you know, they have substrate preferences that are a little bit broader. Water depth, pretty broad preference, velocity. Um, there, there's definitely some areas that may not be suitable velocity for the, the young of the year. And again, came up with habitats that are um, um, good for juvenile sturgeon. About 23% of the river is suitable for juvenile sturgeon. So 12%, 23%, that doesn't sound super high. But um, for, in terms of comparison, um, spawning habitat in um, Lake Michigan tributaries um, with existing spawning populations, um, many of those rivers, only 1 to 10 percent of the river is suitable spawning habitat. So there are many places where a surgeon have hung on in smaller populations um, 
with only one, you know, one to ten percent of the habitat being available for spawning. So twelve percent doesn't sound that bad then. And the Mummy River is large. So most of these places in Lake Michigan are, are much smaller streams. So twelve percent of a much larger river, it's not too bad. It's actually a pretty good expectation for um fish being able to find some place to spawn. So the expectation for in terms of habitat for reintroduction is quite good. So um sort of wrap things up here. Um, you know, environmental talks, man, we all talk about problems. <laughs> it's, all, it's all downhill. So let me summarize the good news <laughs> from um, from what um, from the series of studies. So lots of fish still use the Maumee River for spawning. I showed you data about walleye, about the larval fish assembly. There's, there's a lot of fish going up this corridor through the middle of Toledo, swimming right through the middle of Toledo and using that habitat for spawning. Um, the larval fish assemblage shows improvement from the 70s. And um, quality spawning habitat remains, we think it's likely enough to support lake surgeon reintroduction. So that's, you know, that's that's the good news. But, it's always a but, <laughs> yeah, throw, throw that in. There appears to be some barrier to upstream migration at Jerome Rapids, at least for walleye. We don't think that's really going to be a problem for the much, much larger sturgeon. Um, and we don't know the cause. We don't know for sure why that's happening. Um, and larval fish assemblage diversity is lower than historical. So we're better than the 70s, but there's still things that have not come back. Hopefully the sturgeon will soon, um, you know, be one that does come back. So therefore, what I'm thinking about a lot now is envisioning what types of restoration would provide the most benefit to migratory fish in this river. I showed you earlier the different, you know, river stocks. There's the Detroit River, the Sandusky River. There's ongoing restoration in those rivers that I think is very different from what we would want in the Maumee. In the Detroit River, they're constructing artificial reefs because habitat, spawning habitat was destroyed. Well, we have spawning habitat. Maybe the fish can't get to it. So we don't need the same thing that they're doing in the Detroit River. The Sandusky River, um, hopefully, or you know, probably someday the Ballville Dam is gonna come out, you know. Maybe, I don't know, we've been talking about for a long time. But in the Maumee, fish are not even getting to the dam. So that's not gonna be the same thing that we need in the Maumee River. So, you know, what kind of things can we think about? We look at that picture of the, the black swamp. So, you know, are there places where we can restore marginal wetlands? on the river to help reduce splashiness. Is, is that going to help? Well, that, that might be something that would help if it is indeed velocity that's stopping fish from getting through that point. Um, you know, can't go wrong with better water quality. You know, that's, <laughs> that's going to make everything better. Um, or, you know, are there other places where, where nursery habitats are needed? So what what is it that the Maumee River needs? I don't think, I don't think there's an answer to that. Yet, and I think that um, you know that's that's something that we should be thinking about in this area. What what is it that this river needs to make better fish habitat? So you know, I'd like to think that we can make room for the fish to swim upstream. Um, you know, there's there's less space there. Um, people use the river, but it's obviously important for um, stocks of fish that are important to the lake and all of Ohio. So we should make room for the fish. Um, as always, you know. People who work someplace like this, you know how many people it takes to collect um, all of these data. I mentioned um, a number of the graduate students that have worked on different parts of these projects. Also, um, quite a few undergraduate students that um, have contributed to these in many ways, and um, technicians and other help in the field. So, always, um, you know, thank those people that, that collected the data that you know, we get to look at in an hour. <laughs> Um, any questions? I would be happy, or if you wait, if you do questions afterwards, or we'll do questions however. Questions now. Um, so let's thank Chris for his talk. <laughs> we do have time for some questions before we take a quick break. Yes. How do you know if the Where the dolphin walleye are, or 
see where the people are sitting, where they know they're Yeah, I mean, so I cut Metro Park was probably the, the hot new And you know, like I said, the, the school of fine is high. I didn't know this, but then, you know, I don't think anybody knew it. But then start talking about this in a room with a some DNR fish biologist or other people, and like, oh yeah, I never go up there. You know, so it kind of makes sense with the, the common wisdom, but um, I didn't expect to see it. recommendation is something that the Army Corps of Engineers will absolutely not ever allow. So <laughs> um, uh, if I how long it'll take me to find a, an image of the um, so these islands right here are um, constructed with uh, this one I know was with like highly contaminated sediments. Um, I'm not sure about this one. But you know the the this area right here has been made into a pipe. It just shoots out into the lake. So there's there's no place there for the water to, to spread out and kind of really function as an estuary. And those those are never gonna in my lifetime not gonna be removed. I mean that's a you know, they're not gonna move all that contaminated sediment. So go ahead. Um, what kind of returns do you see with sturgeon to the surface river? Um, you mean like do they always come back to the same place? Um, sturgeon are very faithful to their spawning location, but what we don't know is how many of the juveniles that get released will will live and and you know actually come back. If they if they live to be spawning age, they will probably come back to where they are released. So, go ahead. Is there a way that we as students could help preserve the? Or not even just that, just help help with the, the surgeon population. Is there anything that we could do as students? Well, um, the zoo, cause because this facility is going to be at the Toledo Zoo, I think there'll be a lot of opportunity to support that facility. Um, and, you know, um, the zoo, I think, is very good at outreach and getting people involved. So, so that may be a really, you know, easy, clear opportunity. You can come watch them. You know, you can come look at the babies. Um, you know, supporting that idea through the zoo, I think, would be, you know, a, a real sort of easy one. Next one. Um, was there a certain time of year that you checked for walleye further upstream? Um, we sampled, if you noticed um, the pictures of the sample, there was snow on the ground. Yeah. So, um, you know, really as soon as ice was off the water is when we would expect them to be coming out and we were sampling the whole stretch of the river, you know, simultaneously, going up and down uh, you know, through the sample period. I know um, during the walleye run, there are quite a few guys that go right up by Providence along the dam, and they will catch quite a few. Mm -hmm. um, I just, we, I could, we couldn't sample right at the dam yeah. because it was just it was not a safe place. That's way to too shallow. Be, yeah. So, but then compare that to the number of people upstream. Too. So right. I don't I don't know if the fishermen know exactly where where the fish are, but um, yeah. it, it may be proportional. Am I done? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> if anyone has any um, questions for Chris, um, feel free to ask during a break or or later on after these talks. But now we have time for let's say about an eight minute break. Let's uh, meet back up at eight o'clock for our next talk.
Okay, and now we're uh, back with our final guest lecture for the entire eight-week season. So you're wrapping up. <laughs> I know, a lot of pressure, right? So um, I'm happy to introduce Josh Knight. He's the Executive Director of the Nature Conservancy in Ohio. Um, he will also give a little um, background information, but he received his bachelor's and master's, both from Johns Hopkins University. Um, actually, in international relations. Okay, so a different background than we usually see here at Stone Lab, but um, very interesting where he's um, how he got to where he is now. Uh, we also do a lot of work with Josh Nice and the rest of uh, the Nature Conservancy in Ohio, uh, being here at Ohio Sea Grant Stone Lab, um, some wetland restoration work funded uh, through the Nature Conservancy um, to look at effects on fish populations. So I know a few of you here have um, worked on that wetland project. Um, but with that, I'll let Josh take it away. Kristen, yeah. No, I want to thank Stone Lab uh, for having me out here. Uh, thank Chris Winslow, uh, who wasn't able to be here. Um, and also, just to let you know a little of the history, we've had um, a relationship with Stone Lab for some time because Jeff Reuter, who was the past director here, is on our board of trustees for the Nature Conservancy. And perhaps more than anyone educated this uh, non-ecologist about the importance of the lake, uh, how it functions as a system and why what we do today makes a big difference for the folks that, uh, that come after us. Um, before going any further, I also want to recognize Matt. Do you want to introduce yourself for a second? He, Matt uh, is one of our newer staff members. Uh, I'm Matt Kovach. Um, I was just hired off the Nature Conservancy. I'm the new uh, coastal program manager up here. Um, so I am moving back home to do that. So Matt is the person, if you have a question about wetlands, talk to Matt. So, uh, so I'm the executive director, so I basically, my job is to know uh, who to refer you to when you have a science-based question. Uh, so on the question of wetlands, I'd, I'd refer you to Matt. Um, we've got quite a few other folks on our staff that could tell you about different things, everything related to water quality to oak opening habitat. Uh, glad you guys are going there too. Um, so, you know, my, uh, my background is, is certainly different. How many poli-sci majors in the room? Okay, so it's really kind of going to be a short talk here. Um, I, I, came to the, I came to the Nature Conservancy. Uh, it's a second chapter. I mean, I think for a lot of you, you'll probably start, you'll get into a career, and you may tweak it along the way or decide you want to do something a little bit different. But, you know, my background is probably similar to a lot of you, right? I grew up actually in a rural area in uh, north central Pennsylvania, um, and I would collect garter snakes and bring them home to my mother in my lunchbox. Now, you may not know what a lunchbox is, but I know you know what a gardener steak is. Um, and similar to Chris, you know, have a lot of good experiences growing up, uh, catching all sorts of things, spending a lot of time outdoors, learning what poison ivy is through trial and error, all those types of good things that uh, I think just give you good life skills. So I'm very fortunate in that I run uh, basically the Ohio program of the Nature Conservancy and basically get to work with these amazing experts in all these different areas. And I think one of the things that so inspires me about the Nature Conservancy is, is one, as Chris said, you know, environmentalists tend to focus a lot on the negative. I remember one, um, one of our trustees who was a botanist, and he said, you know, to be able to know what's happening in the forest and to be able to read what's happening in today's forest is, is basically to look at a, at a whole world of wounds. And by that he meant, you know, I can see the invasive species. I can see the, you know, all of the pests and pathogens in the forest. You know, that really doesn't inspire a lot of people to, uh, to take action. But I think one of the things that we need to do and the Nature Conservancy strives to do is to be kind of the organization of hope, all right? We're not the organization of no, you can't do it. It's the organization of how. How can you do it? I remember a story that uh, someone once told me where uh, there was a, a woman in a wheelchair and um, instead of approaching her and saying, you know, do you think you can ever walk again? You know, the, the right question that they asked her was, how do you think you'll be able to walk again? And that gave her the hope and the inspiration to find a way forward to overcome uh, her current disability. So that's a little bit about the Nature Conservancy. We look for solutions. We also look to take all of the work that you guys do and figure out a way to apply it on the ground. 
And I want you to be thinking about this a little bit as I go through some of these slides. Think about what you're studying. So it's great, and I had the pleasure of sitting in with Dr. Bradley for a little bit and learning some uh, about some of the spider identification. And there's someone in here, where is she, who's going to get an A, I'm convinced. I don't know, maybe she went back to go study some more. Um, but in any event, uh, think about what you're learning and how you might apply that as your career goes forward. Um, do you want to be part of a, a, a story where you're restoring sturgeon to a river run that uh, used to be prehistorically um, uh, involved with? Do you want to find ways to <coughs> stop the flow of phosphorus into Lake Erie so that uh, the harmful algal blooms can go away? Do you want to find ways to improve drinking water? Do you want to find ways to um, improve public health? Um, you know, what is it that what you're learning, how can that be applied uh, in terms of the broader, broader world out here? So that's a little bit of, of some of my slides here today. So just be thinking about that as I go through some of these things. So um, I mentioned conserving the Great Lakes as a whole system. What does a whole system mean? Um, we look at it basically as a system that has similar types of geology, um, similar types of flora and fauna. Um, we used to refer to these as ecoregions at the Nature Conservancy, uh, but they have a lot of common characteristics. So the Everglades, uh, the Great Lakes, um, are, are considered ecoregions or whole systems according to the Conservancy. Why are these important? Well, I'll tell you why. Um, and I'll use the example of the oak opening. So the way the Nature Conservancy used to function is we would look at an ecoregion or an area of the country and we would pick out those places that we thought were the best remaining parts that we'd want to go in and protect. And oftentimes we'd buy that property or we'd put an easement on it or we'd work with a, a state or federal agency to go ahead and get that land protected uh, because it was important. So we were basically picking out the best bits that were left. So when we looked at an area like the Western Lake Erie Basin, we didn't see the vast majority of it, okay? We didn't see all of the land that was in agriculture. We didn't see all of the land, the wetlands that had been drained or had been filled, okay? What we saw were the oak openings, which, and Chris had a, a photo with some of those little remnants of the Great Black Swamp, what was left. That's what we saw at the time, but then we thought, all right, are we actually missing the forest by looking just at the trees? And we started to retrain ourselves and rethink a little bit more about looking at the broader system. Because when you do that, you start to look at these streams uh, farther up. You start looking at the connection to the land, including the farmland. Um, and then you start looking at the quality and the health of those streams and ultimately the impacts on Lake Erie. So when you look at this as a whole system, you start to think about you know, the Nature Conservancy shouldn't just be working in the oak openings. We should be looking to partner with Stone Lab, the University of Toledo, and many other great organizations that are trying to make an impact in terms of the health of the lake. So, Chris, when you and I first met, you said, boy, I'm glad to see the Nature Conservancy getting more involved. And, you know, this is a little bit of why we're getting more involved, because we're looking at the landscape more as a whole system rather than just looking at the little, little pieces within that. Does that make sense? to folks in terms of what a whole system is. It is hard. It is very hard sometimes to consider a, an area as a whole system. It's also hard to use it. <laughs> Kristen did it earlier. I talked too long. It went to sleep. It went to sleep. Yeah. Two fish walk into a bar. <laughs> all right, so it, it's hard to think sometimes of the, of the Great Lakes as a whole system, all right? Uh, there are a total of eight U.S. states that go around the Great Lakes. There are two Canadian provinces. Um, there are almost 11,000 miles of shoreline that you have to be thinking about, and uh, a little over 30 million people that live here uh, and have different needs, uses, uh, interest levels in conserving the Great Lakes. So when you think about the number of municipalities, the jurisdictions, all of the different folks that want to use lake for this, that, or the other, 
um, it's easy to start to think of just little sections of, of, the, of the Great Lakes based on where you are. It's also easy to think of the Great Lakes as separate lakes because they are very different, truly, when you look at them. When you look at um, just, you know, major land uses within, within each of the Great Lakes. Lake Erie, uh, with a high amount of cropland, a fair amount of residential area, and not a lot of forest, uh, is very different from Lake Superior, right? So it's easy to start thinking of them as, as different units instead of looking at them as a whole. But there are some very stark reminders as to why we do need to think of this system as a whole system. And a great example of that are zebra mussels. Um, you know, this is obviously the spread of zebra mussels throughout the Great Lakes. And it's, and it's not just the Great Lakes because of man-made connections to other large systems like the Mississippi River Valley through places like the Chicago Sanitary Canal, uh, you see the spread of these uh, zebra mussels. Um, there are other vectors as well, including um, trailer boats, um, uh, and, and obviously zebra mussels got here uh, through, the, uh, through the marine shipping trade. Uh, but, you know, unless we start to think of these systems as, as a whole unit, uh, we risk uh, missing and, and being able to prevent new large invasions, which is going to have an impact even on those little places and pieces that we especially want to preserve. There's another reason to look at uh, the Great Lakes as a whole system. When you start to think of it as an entire unit, you can do a better job in terms of planning and anticipating different types of risks. This is a, a great um, just kind of visual from the Great Lakes Environmental Assessment and Mapping Project um, where they basically looked at, I think it was 34 different types of potential stresses uh, to the Great Lakes and then uh, cumulative, uh, charted out cumulative stress with dark red being at the top and obviously uh, dark blue being uh, relatively stress-free. Um, being able to look at a map like this and think about this becomes very important um, for a very simple reason. We live in a world of scarce resources. Anyone who's taken an economics class, one of the first things they tell you a little bit about is supply and demand. That's the basis for quite a bit of uh, the way we get our work done. Uh, you will probably be encountering at some point in time the need to find funding for research that you might need to do, and you may need to go out and find a grant for that research. So you're going to be experiencing firsthand supply and demand. You have demand for money to do your research. Now you need to go out and find the resources to do it. When you're looking to do and apply resources across the places is as large as the Great Lakes, it becomes very important to think in terms of a whole system because you're going to want to be able to uh, prioritize and figure out where you're going to apply your different resources. All right, so a little bit about the Nature Conservancy and our focus on the Great Lakes. Um, we would like to see the Great Lakes be one of the most uh, well-managed ecosystems on the planet, um, and we've started to break that down into some different categories. I'm going to talk about a few of those tonight. Uh, just as, as examples, but again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how do we take the best available science that's out there, how do we take all the great work that uh, institutions like OSU, Stone Labs, Sea Grant, University of Toledo, and others are generating, and how do we find ways to apply that practically on the ground? All right, so I'm just going to focus on three different areas. One, I'm going to uh, just talk about aquatic invasive species for a moment. And then I'm going to talk about um, the, uh, the whole issue with uh, excessive nutrients. Um, and I promise I will not try to go too much into harmful algal bloom. Uh, but talk more about what we're trying to do on the opposite end to prevent them. And then finally, this is a little bit different. This is something that Nature Conservancy has pioneered. It's called Blue Accounting. Anyone heard of this Blue Accounting yet? Um, so, you know, the idea here is uh, right now there are a lot of programs out there like the Farm Bill. Farm Bill basically pays people to do an activity, okay? If you're a farmer and you put a buffer strip in, you get a check from the Fed to be able to, you know, if you put that buffer strip in, okay? What we would like to see, though, is rather than activity-based uh, incentives, we'd like people to be paid based on whether or not that activity has an outcome. How well does that activity actually keep phosphorus out of the water? Is it doing a good job or is it doing a bad job? Because if it's doing a bad job, we shouldn't be paying you to do that. We should be saving our scarce resources to pay you to do 
those activities that do a good job keeping phosphorus out of the water. So that's why this Blue Accounting Initiative that we've, that we've launched is, is pretty exciting. So let me start with aquatic invasive species. You guys know all this, why we should care, but a lot of the people that you are going to meet on a daily basis either don't care, don't get it, or aren't paying attention. It's your job to be able to communicate the work that you do and put it into terms that someone is going to be able to understand who isn't taking classes at Stone Lab, who isn't an ecologist major, who is someone like me, who came from a different background but cares about these issues and you know, may be able to, to influence the outcome in certain cases. So this is a huge problem just from a cost standpoint, right? A hundred million dollars uh, a year type of a problem. It destabilizes the ecosystem. Why, why do we care about that? Well, you know, if you're a charter boat captain, if you work as Matt did out on the lake, taking people out there and the food chain is disrupted and your, your fisheries, uh, you're not having a good uh, a fishing season, it's going to impact your bottom line and, and your livelihoods, right? And then the other issue is there is some impact uh, in terms of the, the, the um, the water quality, uh, my understanding is, and you guys can correct me on this, is that whereas some, um, uh, some of the introduced um, mussel species, like the zebra mussel and quagga mussel, while they do uh, clear the water by taking some of the algae out, my understanding is that they leave some of the bad algae in and they don't necessarily take that out, and that can have an impact in terms of altering uh, the water quality. So it's not just uh, about uh, invasive species getting into uh, the Great Lakes. We need to be thinking as well about those species that get from the Great Lakes into uh, the rest of the uh, Mississippi River system. Uh, and there are some examples on the top of Great Lakes uh, invasive species that are working their way uh, down uh, potentially. And of course we have the concerns, the big ones being uh, silver carp and big head carp. Uh, coming up through the Chicago Sanitary Canal. As you know, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has a, uh, a barrier there, an electric barrier, uh, which works to a degree because of the, uh, the way the river flows from Lake Michigan um, uh, downstream past Chicago. So any carp trying to get up gets done. The water flow kind of pushes them back. Um, but there are more connections throughout the Great Lakes than, than just the Chicago Sanitary Canal, although that is where the Nature Conservancy is focusing a lot of its efforts right now. Uh, we're trying to work with uh, a variety of different stakeholders and trying to find a way that um, those industries that depend on that canal can, can continue to depend on that canal, but at the same time we are helping to uh, prevent uh, any type of ecological transference of carp from getting up from the Mississippi River into the Great Lakes. So we're looking at a number of different possibilities, the use of heat, the use of chemicals like chlorine to clean the water uh, before uh, barges that are going from the Mississippi River are going uh, up into the Great Lakes and vice versa as a potential way of addressing this. So it's, it's important too, when you think about these things from a scientific standpoint, a lot of people would say, we need to separate the two barriers physically. Uh, they weren't uh, connected historically. Uh, they are, uh, they never should have been connected. And look what's happened since we've connected them. We've got all these invasive species that are making it into these two big basins. The, 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 the horse is out of the barn on that, okay? There are many, many different economic interests that rely on these connections. Millions of dollars of goods get shipped through there. So you need to, in whatever solution you come up with, you need to take their interests into account. Why? Because otherwise they're going to oppose what you uh, want to do and they will throw money at that and put influence at that. And so uh, sitting down and trying to take their interests and needs into account at the same point in time that you're trying to take nature's interests and needs into account is, is where the Nature Conservancy is trying to make a difference. So there's a lot of different solutions out there. Obviously, uh, with aquatic invasive species, uh, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So um, trying to prevent the invasion in the first place. If that doesn't work, um, early detection, rapid response, and then finally you're faced with eradication and some control like with the sea lamprey and the lamprey side mm -hmm. that we use uh, for them since they're already in, in, 
the Great Lakes. So here's an example, though, of uh, another practicality that we face. Each of those different states that I mentioned um, that surround the Great Lakes, and this has to do with uh, um, trailer vehicles, uh, transporting trailer vehicles, which can obviously pick up different uh, unwanted hitchhikers uh, as you move uh, from different lakes and different rivers. Each of the states around there has a different type of law on the book. And so this becomes a situation where the weak, weakest link in the chain is most likely to be where you would expect to find that type of invader. Now, if I just focus on one state, again, if I don't look at this as a whole system and I just focus on this as one state, I may be missing where that weak, weakest link is. But if you sit down and you start to look at and map out, okay, uh, we've got some good laws on the books up in Minnesota and Michigan and Illinois, sorry, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, uh, so so in Pennsylvania, Indiana, Ohio, okay, uh, typical. We need to work on that. Uh, there's no laws on the books that we, that we need to address that. So that is, that is one of our priorities from a public policy standpoint. What about Canada? So uh, Canada is, um, that's a great question. And I, there were, Canada was probably in the notes to this slide, which I don't have in front of me. I'm not sure what their current <laughs> situation is, but working with the two provinces is very important. And one of the things that actually um, just got signed between Michigan, Ohio, and the province of Ontario was a new uh, agreement, a collaboration on aquatic invasive species. Um, and one of those is looking at is, is harmonization is the term they use, trying to harmonize the policies in those different jurisdictions so that you don't have any weak, weak links in the chain, if that makes sense. Good question. I'm sorry I didn't have a better answer. So this is uh, actually this is from our board meeting that we just had on Friday. Um, and the gentleman in the middle is Representative Dave Hall. He is a representative from Medina, Ohio, which is not on the lake. Uh, but Representative Hall cares very much about water quality. He is a Republican. He is a former chair of the Committee on Agriculture and Natural Resources. So we have been working with Representative Hall uh, to try to strengthen Ohio's laws in terms of trade in organisms, aquatic organisms. Because right now the situation we have is in Ohio, we have a definition for aquatic invasive species and we have some enforcement penalties, but there's no clear transparent way that you put uh, aquatic invasive species on, on a prohibited list. Michigan recently passed the law to make that very clear. So we've been working with Representative Hall on language, and we're going to work with the Department of Natural Resources. They're actually reviewing the language as well. Uh, we're working with them to come up with a, a basically a protocol, a transparent protocol so uh, the folks at the Division of Wildlife here in Ohio can look at a new species that someone may want to sell as part of the aquarium trade or bring in as bait for fishing and be able to say, all right, we're going to run this through our protocol and we're looking for certain types of features which point to or would indicate that that, that species could be invasive in this area. Uh, so Representative Hall has uh, done a great amount of work uh, on water quality here in, in Ohio. And he is our champion um, right now, uh, working with us um, to try to get that um, uh, to try to get that bill passed by the end of this year. Um, see. And uh, by the way, uh, Jeff Reuter was at the uh, at our board meeting on Friday and had a chance to uh, to talk with him as well. So that's a little bit about prevention. I'm going to talk just for a second here about early detection. Uh, and because uh, obviously the quicker you can detect something, the better chance you have before the population gets established and gets too large to do anything about it to eradicate it, right? Um, so this is a, a photo of um, a wildlife official uh, taking a samples. Um, and it's part of some eDNA testing. How many of you guys have done eDNA testing? Anybody in the room? Do, does, do people know what eDNA testing is? A few people? So eDNA testing, this is great. This is like, you know, CSI um, uh, for um, aquatic invasive species. Basically, um, different types of fish species um, or aquatic invasive species, they leave cells behind while they're in the water, um, either through uh, the elimination of waste or just the sloughing of skin. 
And as a result, what they end up doing is um, leaving genetic markers in the water. So by taking, the, taking these samples, taking them back to the lab, you can test for to see whether or not you find the genetic evidence of carp, snakehead fish, all sorts of different things that you don't want to have. Now, does that mean even if you have a positive hit that that species is there? No, uh, you know, there could be something wrong with the test. Maybe the water has gotten contaminated at some point in time, but it does, if you find enough hit, uh, give you enough of an indication that you probably should go out and start looking for those individuals in that area. This becomes very important because obviously if you've got a large area that you're trying to look at, you can't physically send people out to look at all those different areas. So having a test like this that gives you some kind of an early indication is going to be very important. And the Nature Conservancy worked closely with Notre Dame and a number of other, uh, University of Notre Dame and a number of other uh, organizations to try to pull the eDNA testing, uh, and we've tried to popularize it, get more agencies to use it. Um, one of the uh, other important issues in terms of detection is to be able to figure out if you've got, you know, you saw the slide at the very uh, beginning, almost 11,000 miles of coastline that you've got to be worried about maybe in terms of where a new invasive species might come into uh, the Great Lakes system, how are you going to survey all of that? Well, one of the things the Conservancy has been doing is working with um, some federal agencies to try to figure out what are the hot spots, and a lot of them actually are around urban areas, as you can see here. What are some of the hot spots that are read here where we probably need to spend more time and prioritize more of our resources than some of the other areas, right? Um, and again, if you're not looking at the Great Lakes as a whole system and you're just looking at one area, um, it becomes a little bit more difficult to find those areas and to prioritize that way. Um, so this is, uh, this is actually a great way to figure out uh, with those scarce resources where to, where to direct them, where to apply them. So in terms of um, excessive nutrients, nutrient loading, a uh, huge issue, uh, why should we care? Well, you know, obviously if you're in the city of Toledo, you've got, uh, uh, I'm sure everybody who's in the city of Toledo has a personal story from August 2014, uh, what they were doing and what happened when, um, you know, the water supply uh, was, was turned off uh, for about two and a half days. Um, but even before then, there were very common uh, public advisories on the beaches when the harmful algal bloom got too large and folks were worried about the microcystin levels um, in the lake. Um, but it's not just that. It's the aquatic habitat. We heard a lot from Chris uh, just a few minutes ago about the importance of looking at the stream habitat um, in addition to the lake habitat and the connectivity between the two of those. Obviously, when um, when the algae dies, especially in the central basin, it goes down b below the thermocline. Jeff, if you're on the phone, I hope you're proud of me that I remembered all these things. You taught me everything I know about the dead zone. And uh, the dead zone obviously has a big impact in the central basin. Um, and then finally, recreation and tourism, huge, huge industry. I mean, we frequently, when we go to these meetings to talk about the harmful algal bloom, we'll see the charter boat captain folks there. They are there in force, and they are angry. They want stuff done, and they want it done yesterday because their business, their livelihood is on the line here. So again, when you talk about the work that you do, when you talk about the sampling that you're doing or the species that you're studying, um, put, them in, put it in the bigger context. Why do, should people care about uh, you know, the phosphorus levels? Well, because it could impact your drinking water, because it could you know, impact your ability to go out and enjoy the lake. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, and he, here, uh, and again, uh, looking at the whole Great Lakes as a whole system, um, you know, we think, and obviously we're very sensitive to because we live here, we're very sensitive to the harmful algal bloom situation in the Western Lake Erie Basin, but, but it's not just here, you know, it's in Saginaw Bay, it's up in Green Bay. Um, so we need to be thinking about the whole, uh, the whole system and the impacts. And importantly, we need to be thinking about if we come up with solutions here, all right, and we're thinking about this as a whole system, can we take those solutions and apply them elsewhere throughout the Great Lakes Basin, okay? Again, we could have a really great idea, um, but if we're not figuring out a way to export it and get to those other areas, we're not thinking of the whole Great Lakes as a whole system, we may miss some opportunities to take some lessons that we've learned 
or some new tools that we've developed and, and deploy those in other areas. So in terms of some of the solutions that we've been thinking of, there's now, uh, there was another actually collaborative when they signed the Aquatic Invasive Species Collaborative. They also uh, signed a collaborative between Ontario, Michigan, and Ohio that we want to reduce the amount of nutrients going into Lake Erie by 40% by the year 2025. And that's a big deal. To actually have a target with a numerical number and a deadline is extremely important. Okay? Some of the ways that we can get there, so agriculture. Agriculture is the majority of nutrient loading in the Western Lake Erie Basin. So obviously working with the agricultural community, finding new ways to um, help them reduce the amount of fertilizer they have to use, but also finding ways to keep the fertilizer on the field through incorporation um, and other edge of field practice and, and edge of field practices to keep them out of the waterways is going to be extremely important. But one of the things that we've learned recently is that we're not going to be able to stop all of the uh, phosphorus from getting down into Lake Erie just through agricultural practices alone. We need to think about promoting the use of natural infrastructure. We need to think about restoring some of the wetlands that were here when there was the Great Black Swamp uh, on marginal cropland so that those wetlands can take up some of the nutrients um, that are actually flowing down and stop them from getting downstream into Lake Erie. And then finally, we think there is a, an opportunity here to do more with um, local communities um, improving things like failing septic systems and other things, but a lot of the community um, sources of phosphorus, we call them point sources uh, many times, a wastewater treatment plant, uh, for example, what comes out of the pipe, that's the point. Those are uh, currently regulated by the Clean Water Act, so we don't think there's going to be a large amount of um, reduction we can get from those sources. But looking at working with the farmers and looking at ways to promote more natural infrastructure within the watershed are ways to get there. And there are ways we can do that. Nature Conservancy thinks you've got to have everything on the table. We need to look at regulations and we need to look at uh, voluntary programs as well. So I'm going to mention one voluntary program that we developed here in the Western Lake Erie Basin. And this is an example of a program, a solution we developed here, okay, Ohio Grown that we want to then export to other parts of the Great Lakes and actually also parts of, uh, parts of the Mississippi River Basin as well. It's called the 4R Nutrient Certification Program and essentially we're working with those companies that are hired by the farmers to apply the fertilizer on their fields. So I never really appreciated this when I first uh, started to look at this, uh, this question, but not all farmers, in fact many farmers, are not the ones that are doing the soil testing and figuring out how much fertilizer they have to apply on the field. There's a whole industry called nutrient service providers, a very famous one in this area in, in the northwest part of, uh, of Ohio is the Andersons. Okay? They do a lot in terms of selling fertilizers to the farmers and they will have advisors who will come out to a farmer's field, take soil samples and say, Here's what I recommend that you spread on your farm, and oh, by the way, I can do that for you if you would like me to do that. So think about it. Think about how many thousands of farmers there are uh, in the Western Lake Erie Basin and how hard it would be to get to all of those. However, there are a much smaller number of these so-called nutrient service providers, the folks that are hired by the farmers. So think about it. Here's your point of leverage, right? If you're trying to apply this and get something done on the ground, if you can get to those companies like the Andersons and you can get them to change their practices, then they will have an impact on all of their clients that they service. So if you get one nutrient service provider, that nutrient service provider has 100 farmers as clients, you've already reached 100 farmers through one, one nutrient service provider. So if you can get 50, or 100, or, or however many there are, 150, or actually aren't, aren't, there's a finite number of large ones in the, uh, in the watershed. You can have a huge impact. So we developed this. It's called the 4R Nutrient Certification Program. The idea is to apply the 4Rs, uh, which are, oh, I think they're on the next slide here, applying fertilizer, the right source of fertilizer, the right type, the right rate, putting it on the right time. You obviously don't want to put fertilizer on uh, when the ground is frozen or right before a major rain event and putting it in the right place, okay? 
and you will see that uh, uh, basically by working uh, on this through just a handful of these. Uh, so here we go. So we've got uh, commitments from it looks like 45. Um, let's see. Okay, 25 certified branch locations here. Uh, commitments to go through the process from 45 other branches of different nutrient service providers. We can have a huge impact on the number of clients. About 1,700 clients. Oh, sorry, that's outside. 2,600 clients within the Western Lake Erie Basin. 1,700 outside of the Western Lake Erie Basin. But then this is where it becomes very impressive. Impressive. So here's the number of actually acres that are being enrolled in that process just by being able to reach a small number of these nutrient service providers. It gets pretty impressive pretty quickly. Um, so this is something that has really taken off very quickly. This program has been around for about two years, a little over two years. Um, and now what we're doing is we're looking at ways that we can apply that to other uh, basins within the, uh, the Great Lakes, I'm sorry, with other bays within the Great Lakes, but then also how can we apply that in the Mississippi River watershed. Um, we're also doing a little bit of work on trying to figure out wh which of those activities that the farmers are doing are getting you the best nutrient reduction. Um, and this gets back to the point that if we're going to spend money and we're going to invest money in different practices, we want to be able to know which of those activities um, get you uh, the best amount of nutrient reduction, your best return on investment, in other words, your most bang for the buck. Um, there's a lot of collaborators in this conservation effect assessment uh, project, including Ohio State University and Sea Grant, which we're very pleased to be working with uh, in other ways. Um, and uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, some of the uh, summary of those results is that um, simply doing more of the same uh, ag practices is not going to work. I think you've all heard uh, Albert Einstein's definition of insanity. It's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Uh, that's the case here. So we need to be thinking about some new policy and funding mechanisms to increase uh, implementation. One of the important issues is the dissolved reactive phosphorus. This is actually when farmers say, we're not actually applying more phosphorus than we were historically. In fact, maybe in some cases they're able to show that they're actually using a little bit less phosphorus. But what they're doing is they are applying uh, dissolved reactive phosphorus versus particulate phosphorus, and this is much more bioavailable. It's a liquid form. It's easier for plants to take up, and it's easier for the blue-green algae to take up. So think of it this way. If you have a pint of beer and a pint of scotch, and you were to drink one and then kind of measure the impact on yourself, obviously the pint of scotch is going to have a much bigger impact on you than the pint of beer. It's the same thing when you think about particulate phosphorus and dissolved reactive phosphorus. So this is something where um, the uh, conservation effect assessment program had a lot more to say about how to deal with dissolved reactive phosphorus. And again, it's, it's trying to figure out what kind of practices and where those practices are uh, is obviously going to be very important in terms of directing resources. All right, so I'm going to finish up with a little counting here. Um, and there's only a couple slides here. Why should we care? Again, limited resources out there, right? Um, we need to figure out where to, where to put the money to make the biggest bang for the buck. But, you know, when you give someone money, you also want to you wanna know that they actually did what they said they were going to do and they got the results that, they, that uh, you had hoped to have gotten, right? Uh, you also want to make sure that there's a certain degree of transparency with how they're using that money. And then finally, there are opportunities, as I mentioned with the 4R Nutrient Certification Program, to take lessons and tools that you learn in certain parts of the basin, the whole system, and apply it elsewhere. Um, so as a result, um, the Nature Conservancy, working with uh, a, a large number of other groups, helped to launch a, a new system, a blue counting system, uh, which is essentially looking at, and this is kind of an earlier prototype or an example of what it would look like, but you know, trying to um, take these different types of tools and find a way to um, house them together so that different types of practitioners um, can figure out, well, if I'm going to work in my area, uh, what should I be focusing on? What's going to give me the best return? What are the strategies that are going to make the biggest difference uh, for me reaching the goals that I want to reach? Uh, and this actually uh, is something that's very appealing to a lot of policymakers that have to decide whether or not we're going to make this money available for um, action within the Great Lakes. 
So if we can assure those Great Lakes leaders, if we can say to them, look, we have a way that you can wait and make well-informed decisions and figure out how to, how to take Great Lakes restoration initiative dollars or other money that you're spending in the basin, um, then if they're more reassured about that, we think we can uh, get more money to have a healthier and, and more sustainably managed uh, system here. So I'm just going to wrap up and, and with a couple of uh, takeaways here as you think about you know, why is the Nature Conservancy so um, focused on the whole system? Again, because the whole is only as healthy as all of its parts. We need to be thinking about where the weakest link is, what can we be doing to shore those areas up, how can we harmonize policies around the Great Lakes. Uh, we need to be able to prioritize our limited resources. We need to figure out where they need to go and, and what they should pay for. And then um, finally, uh, to be able to continue to have uh, the trust of the public and policymakers, we need to have performance-based outcomes so that we can say to people, we actually got the results that we said we would get for the money that you gave us. So here's probably the most memorable slide that I'm going to show you this evening. Um, and I'll go ahead and close uh, one of my favorite beers from the Great Lakes. I actually met with Pat Conway, who is the um, founder. He and his brother founded the Great Lakes Brewing Company. And I tried to convince him I had this great idea. I decided all these freshwater mussel species, like fat mucket and pink hill splitter and warty dwarf back and purple cat's paw and whatnot, I was like, that, that is an awesome line of names for a craft beer. Um, but he has yet to take me up on any of those. So, there you go. All right, well, thanks. I'm going to go ahead and stop there and ask you any questions. So the sanitary uh, channel itself was actually uh, made to ship all of uh, Chicago sewage down to St. Louis, essentially. Uh, so they actually had a problem in that the Chicago River 
actually flowed into Lake Michigan, and that's where Chicago was getting its drinking water. So they said, if we re-engineer this and reverse the flow and connect it up with the Mississippi River, um, that will actually, you know, our, we can just flush our sewage then into the sanitary canal, and it'll wash away, and it becomes St. Louis's and everybody else's problem downstream. Okay, so that's actually why they put the, the channel in. And it's interesting. There's there's actually bathtub rings, so to speak. You can see Lake Michigan actually dropped, and this is of course years ago when they put it in decades ago when they put it in, but Lake Michigan is actually at a lower level because of the sanitary canal than it was historically. Um, so what they did, though, is what the Army Corps put in are um, electric barriers, um, where there is an area where they've got, um, they're generating a high amount of, um, of, of a current. Uh, and so any fish that kind of goes into, it's like a, electroshocking for fish. Any fish that goes into that area is kind of temporarily stunned. Um, but because the flow is going back down the river, um, it, it'll wash those fish back down and rather than have them continue up into the Great Lakes. Um, the problem is, that, or what happens is, that if you have a fish like the Eurasian Ruff, which is up in you know, parts of the Great Lakes, uh, there's nothing stopping that from going down that into, and in fact, you know, that's where you see some species making jump from the Great Lakes into the Mississippi River. We in Ohio worry so much about keeping stuff out of the Great Lakes that we forget there are some invasive in the Great Lakes that are getting into the rest of the country through through that uh, channel. So it's a two-way street, and we need to be cognizant of that when you design some type of a solution. That makes sense. Yes? Um, I was wondering when you showed that map, the lakes that were further up north seem to have less high-stress areas. Is there something that they're doing differently up in Canada to like, prevent that, or is it just to do with the fact that like, the, the pollution the problems can you know, there are probably a dozen people on the phone who could answer that better than I could. You know, my guess is that it's land use uh, has a big impact on it. If you look at a place like Lake Superior, um, a lot, and you saw my one of my first slides where it was showing what land use was, you see a high amount of forested area and a lot of wetland area. Whereas if you look at Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, there's a lot of residential, a lot of agriculture. I mean, you've lost a lot of the the um, land. Um, the habitat around those lakes that would have helped to kind of shield, buffer, clean the water that's going in, those types of things. You know, think of our Western Lake Erie Basin. You know, not a lot of wetlands or forests uh, are helping to clean that uh, water that's going down the Maumee into Lake Erie. And we've ditched and channelized a lot of those. So the flow is much quicker. Uh, it was kind of the, you know, Chris was describing in some areas it's just like, a, you know, especially at the mouth of the Maumee like a fire hose with the water coming out. And what happens in that case is that it just, it just washes all of the stuff that you don't want into the lake versus if you have a natural meander as you do in some of those streams, probably for the northern lake, that allows sediment and, and nutrients to kind of settle out over time and not reach you know, those lakes. Um, yeah, I also think the water temperature makes a huge impact in terms of invasives. Um, you know, you've got uh, Lake Erie in Ontario, Lake Erie being the shallowest and warmest and southernmost of the, of the Great Lakes. And so as a result, you know, it's very nutrient rich. It's a great place for species to uh, thrive. Colder lake, like Lake Superior, probably a little bit harder for some invasive species to come in. Yes? Do you have any uh, additional recommendations for community involvement? Community involvement. Um, well, so a group like the Nature Conservancy, we have different volunteer activities uh, going on. Um, but, uh, you know, I think one of the best things that you can do is just be able to talk to uh, friends, neighbors, family members, and others about why Stone Lab and um, OSU and University of Toledo, why the work being done here on research and developing new strategies and systems is so important, and why the Nature Conservancy and partnering with different uh, organizations like Stone Lab, trying to get stuff on the ground is so important and encourage them to support that work. I mean, I think that, that can make a huge difference because, again, at the end of the day, it's trying to get resources to, trying to get resources. You know, I tell all of our staff at the Nature Conservancy, you are three things. You are foremost a conservationist, even if you don't have a background in conservation like I do. Everybody's here because we have a passion for conservation. We hold that very uh, dear to our hearts. Uh, but secondly, um, everybody is an ambassador. Everybody should be able to talk to people um, and explain what we do, why we do it, but most importantly, why it should matter to the person that you're talking to. 
And then finally, we're all fundraisers. At the end of the day, we have to figure out how we're going to get the resources uh, to do the work that we want to do. Because it's great if we can do research and you can write a paper, but if it sits on a shelf and you can never figure out a way to apply it because you don't have the resources, you know, it, it's almost as if you didn't do the research. So thanks for your question. And Kristen, thank you. I've enjoyed it. Uh, it's just been a lot of fun. So thanks to all of you. Okay. I think that's it. Um, we're wrapping up our last guest lecture uh, for this season. So um, thanks again, everyone, for coming. And um, I'll see a lot of you tomorrow. <laughs>